So good morning, everyone. Welcome to this plenary session. Uh, my name is Elisa Molinari from the University of Modena and the CNR in Modena, Italy. And it's my pleasure to introduce your first speaker, who is Professor Corey Dean from, the, from Columbia University, New York. Um, his talk is going to be about engineering Van der Waals uh, heterostructure with a twist or something like that. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, so thank you for uh, inviting me to this conference. This is the first time I've been at Graphene Week, and it's uh, already been a pretty uh, fantastic experience. And I hope the rest of the week is the same. I'm sure it will be. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, engineering Van der Waals heterostructures, as was said, uh, with a twist. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, new degrees of freedom that are available in these systems where we can rotate uh, layers between each other, and a lot of new physics can emerge, et cetera. Because this uh, week seems to be fairly focused on uh, kind of technological applications, I'm going to talk a bit about the science, but I'm going to try to highlight where I think uh, the things we can do might have some real connection to device technologies, uh, possibly sometime in the future. Okay. Um, so just to recap, uh, I'm sure everybody in this room is familiar with most of the background of this uh, field, so I'm just going to go through this quickly. But to recap, there are many uh, two-dimensional materials now that we have access to. This is a really nice figure now uh, from uh, many years ago now, uh, a review written by Professor Geim in which he pointed out in a nice set of, kind of summary that there are many materials that can be made two-dimensional. And the thing that's interesting about this is that these materials have all kinds of different properties. So they span the whole gamut of what you can have access to. Semiconducting, insulating, metallic, most recently, topological insulators have been identified, uh, magnets, semiconducting magnets, uh, you name it, we have access to it. And uh, the nice thing is that we can uh, exfoliate these materials, as you all know. We can then um, layer them back together. So uh, the technique that I'm going to be referencing today is one that was also developed now a number of years ago um, at Columbia. But the basic idea is that we can isolate a single, a single layer material we can pick it up, we can move it around, we can put it on top of another material, and so on. So again, these are kind of old results, but just to give a nice sort of visual of what we can do, here is sort of the starting point for us, um, what we call graphene BN heterostructures. I can place a BN layer, a graphene layer, and then a BN layer on top of that. We can mix different materials, and we can really have a lot of fun with these materials. Okay, so the, what we can really do is we can build brand new materials now. We can mix and match these different uh, constituents. We can put together things that have never been put together before. Really, the future is our limit. What I like to say to people in my own lab is that the problem we have now is that there's too many things to do, and what really should we be doing is kind of the challenge. But again, going back to this review of Professor Geim, uh, we're in a moment in kind of time now where we can realize what then was a real cartoon image. And I really like this image because it sort of suggests the kind of freedom we have which is that we can view these materials just as Lego building blocks. We can reach into our toy bin, and we can put together anything we want and sort of go from there. OK, so as much as I like this image, I think it missed one, uh, it missed one critical opportunity, which is that these materials are not actually rigid in the way this would suggest. But more so, there are degrees of freedom that, uh, if we view these as Lego blocks, uh, um, we have access to that, uh, that are not anticipated by, excuse me, by this cartoon. Okay, so that's what I'm gonna talk about today. I'm gonna to talk about um, these new degrees of freedom that we have access to in these structures. And there's really kind of three, and they're all actually related, but I'm just gonna separate them out here. So one is because of the weak uh, Van der Waals interlayer uh, attraction between these layers. We have freedom to rotate these layers one relative to the other, and there's no impediment to doing that. There's no crystal bonds between the layers, so we can really rotate uh, any angle we, will, excuse me, we want. There are different techniques we can apply to vary the interlayer separation. And additionally, we can do some interesting patterning of these materials. And this can take two forms, uh, one in the form of a moray pattern, which we'll talk about, other in the form of more like you know, lithography kind of structuring, et cetera. OK, so uh, let's begin with the first, twisting. So this uh, is a cartoon image of, say, a boronitride layer. I'm just showing here a top-down cartoon. And on top of this, I'm going to place a graphene layer. This is uh, historically the starting point for this um, kind of whole effort. So what that looks like is this. And what you see just visually on, this, on the screen is that the uh, lattice mismatch between this uh, BN and graphene layer give rise to a pattern we call moray pattern. Uh, we can rotate this layer around. 
Uh, and as we do so, this Moray pattern uh, varies. Uh, its length scale varies as a function of angle. What this is really reflecting is that because of the lattice mismatch, uh, locally there's a different alignment. Sorry, this laser pointer. Locally, there's, there's a little different alignment of, in some areas, the carbon is on top of boron, in some areas, the carbon is on top of nitrogen, and so on. So I'll come back to that later. But this is the cartoon picture of what you might expect you would see if you actually put these two crystals together. Is this reality? In fact, it is. So here's some really nice STM work, not done by me. This is done by the um, uh, Leroy Group uh, in the US. Uh, here, basically, this is a graphene on boron nitride, different topographic images. These are not atomic scale images. If you look at the scale bar, what these are are actually visual uh, image of the uh, Moray uh, topography. So um, then I can put... Uh, I can put, for example, leads in such a device. I can measure the transport response. And what, what I see is quite remarkable. Uh, in the end, as was predicted, electrons moving through this graphene layer scatter off of this moray potential. And what that does is it gives rise to additional features in the band structure of the graphene. So here's the kind of native charge neutrality point with the linearly dispersing bands that touch at the charge neutrality point as you expect. And then in some high energy, what I get is new, uh, what's sometimes called replica direct points emerging basically at the Brewan zone edge of this uh, super lattice. So indeed, transport shows the signature of the charge neutrality point as we normally see, and then two additional peaks symmetrically located around that. And these peaks basically reflect the low density of states uh, that emerge at these new replica Dirac points. Okay, so uh, what I wanna highlight from this work, which is uh, also several years old now, is that in addition to these satellite peaks, this is plotted on log scale now, the resistivity of such a device also shows a very high resistance at the charge neutrality peak. And in fact, it, it, in fact, it's gapped there. So I can plot the activation energy that I get from this uh, kind of plot. And what I see is that there's a gap that emerges at around uh, 40 MeV, uh, best case scenario, when the graphene is exactly zero angle aligned to the boron nitride. So the reason I want to emphasize this, as I said, this is kind of, uh, the focus of this week is kind of uh, technology applications. And one of the things that was said very, uh, as pointed out early on about graphene is that there's no band gap. And because there's no band gap, the technology that you can do with graphene is in some sense limited. But this is an interesting um, observation that this is a way to actually induce a band gap of graphene by simply aligning it to a, a, a boron nitride uh, substrate. Okay, so a lot of groups uh, notice this. There's some interesting trend in how the gap evolves with angle. Remember the wavelength goes in inverse with angle, so this is actually zero degrees in this end and about five degrees back here. So what's the origin of this gap? Uh, there was a significant amount of sort of discussion about this, but uh, I think you can sort of understand this in a simple picture by going back to this image of what the Moray pattern looks like. And if you look in detail, what you see is that the coloring here reflects basically the alignment of the carbon over the boron nitride. In this area, we have what we might call an AB stacking, in this area, BA stacking, and in this area, an AA stacking is sort of shown here. And the basic idea, uh, if you like, is that um, coupling of the boron nitride breaks the inversion symmetry of the graphene layer, and as a consequence, uh, that's what opens the band gap, at least at the charge neutrality point. Okay, so controlling the angle is fun, and we can do a lot of interesting stuff with it. If we have two, uh, 2D materials, how do we actually control this angle? This is sort of the uh, challenge I'll be discussing for the next um, kind of you know, major portion of my talk. Uh, one of the things we noticed early on, uh, this is going back again, I think about 2013, is that uh, these systems are very low friction. So what I'm showing here is a real optical image, it's false colored, where on the bottom I have boron nitride, then I have a graphene layer, then on top of that I have another boron nitride. So this graphene is really sandwiched between two pieces of boron nitride. And we apply just a little bit of heat, this heating is um, about 300 degrees, and uh, C. And what we see is that with heating, this graphene translates. This scale bar is 10 microns. So it's translated by tens of microns, and it's rotated by many degrees uh, just by application of heat. So it does that for two reasons. One is that um, it suggests that the graphene is under a certain amount of strain, and heating allows it to move to a lower strain uh, configuration. At least that's our, our understanding. The second is that uh, it suggests that there's very low friction at the interface uh, between these crystals because this can move so easily and, and so, uh, so largely. So this gives us uh, an interesting idea. Because the friction is low, we can sort of induce some kind of rotation, we think. So I, I, I should mention that what we understand over time is that this is rotating from an angle that's not aligned to either these two BNs to an angle that is aligned to one of the two BNs. We'd like to do that in a more controlled way. 
And because the friction is low, we think we can do that mechanically. So we developed a scheme shown here where we can imagine, for example, making a, a device. This is a cartoon image of graphene uh, layer. And on top of that graphene layer, we put a boronitride uh, capping layer, we call it. But we shape that boronitride into the shape of a gear. And then we come in with an AFM tip, and we just mechanically rotate this around. So here's a real uh, AFM image of such a device. I've got a graphene layer, and on top of that boronitride, and I can imagine that with my AFM tip as a mechanical actuator, I can physically just rotate this uh, boronitride gear. So is this reality? Can we actually do this in, uh, for real? Uh, yes, we can. Here again is an AFM image. Uh, here I'm just highlighting what the different parts are. And then here is a composite image of several different AFM scans, uh, kind of rotating this around. Uh, so uh, we can't image this in real time. We're just sort of taking slices uh, in time and, and putting them together. OK, so now I can really, with a large degree of control, I think, make a device in which I can dynamically tune the properties of the device by mechanically uh, interacting with it in a way that's new, by rotating dynamically the, uh, the orientation between the layers. OK, so here's now uh, uh, a number of uh, measurements, basically, of resistance on this axis and effectively density on this axis. As I take the system and I change, I sort of turn this gear, I rotate the alignment between this PN and the bottom graphene. This is the charge neutrality point, and this is the satellite peak whose position and density correlates with um, basically the angle of the uh, graphene uh, relative to the top bore and I tried. So from the position of that um, density, uh, that satellite peak, I can actually determine what the angle is because I know the, how the wavelength of the moray evolves with angle. I can plot that angle, and all I really want to emphasize here is that uh, we can actually control this orientation to a really fine precision. So about 0.1 degree precision, we can vary the actual orientation between the VN and the graphene. And we can measure its, its uh, orientation electrically. Uh, it doesn't need to be measured optically uh, uh, by the position of the satellite peak. OK, so when I, can, when I make such a measurement, I get actually new information that's kind of interesting. So here now I'm plotting the gap again, how it evolves as a function of angle. What we see is that near zero angle, I get a gap values that are similar to what I observed before. I can measure the gap both at the charge neutrality point and this kind of satellite point, which is also activated. And what we see that broadly, not surprisingly, is that the gap uh, is maximal at zero angle, and it diverges towards zero with a, within a small degree of twist. Uh, what you notice here is that there's a lot of uh, what looks like kind of noise in the measurement of the gap uh, at the charge neutrality point as a function of angle. But in fact, this appears to be real. Uh, several of these data points, this was, not taken in a, sorry, this was not taken in a linear fashion. In fact, some of these data points, you can see they're overlapping. This data point was taken. We'd moved to some other angle. We came back. And uh, here again, we were here. We moved to some other angle. We came back. And we seem to be reproducing this structure. So this kind of fluctuation in the gap is probably revealing some fine details of how the graphene lattice itself is really uh, relaxing to the boron nitride. But uh, we don't yet have a full understanding of that. OK. OK, so that's interesting. Uh, most recently, uh, this is work that's not published, but it's coming online, I think, in a, about a week or two. What we've thought about is if we have a similar system, we have graphene, we can put boron nitride on top. We also have boron nitride on bottom. In the previous measurements, we were assuming that this bottom BN was just at some large but unknown uh, angle relative to the graphene. Now what we want to do is we want to think about controlling all three of these angles. So we'll call theta bottom the angle between the graphene and the bottom. And we'll call theta top the angle between the top BN and the graphene. Uh, we're going to go back to our cartoon picture here. We started off in this situation. Graphene is on the bottom. Previously, it was misaligned. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to uh, align that graphene to the bottom BN. And then we're going to add a second BN on top. Uh, here's the configuration. And we're going to control the angle of the top uh, BN layer. So now we have something that's pretty interesting. We have two different moray uh, lattices coming from two different interfaces, bottom and top. And we want to see how those two interplay with each other. Uh, so the, simple, the scenario I'm describing is going to be the simplest we can think about. Uh, again, graphene is aligned to the bottom, and we rotate the top. In the extreme, there are really kind of two scenarios that that, that gives rise to. So in the first scenario, uh, we can imagine uh, two fully aligned scenarios. In the first scenario, we imagine that we take the boron nitride layer that's on top, and we exactly align it in the same configuration as the boron nitride that's on the bottom. So if we just focus on this image, for example, this is in this little area here of the moray pattern. 
what you see is that uh, the two BNs are basically symmetrically aligned. So this carbon sees nitrogen top and bottom, and this carbon sees boron uh, top and bottom. So this basically we would expect would just double the same effect that we had when we had just half of the system. So this is just the same thing again as, as uh, graphene aligned to boron nitride, but just on both sides. So this we call uh, the top layer at zero degrees falls to the bottom. There's a second configuration that emerges when you think about this for a little bit. Excuse me, which is the following. Uh, now we take the, the top boron nitride layer and we rotate it by exactly 60 degrees. And now what you get is a situation in which the two BNs are, are what we call kind of anti-aligned to each other. So now looking at this kind of cell again, now I see what happens is this carbon is aligned to B on the top and N on the bottom. And this carbon is aligned in the inverse way, boron on the bottom and nitrogen on the top. So when you go through this, what you can sort of show is that in this configuration, uh, inversion symmetry is indeed broken, uh, but you might expect that the potential of the moray is kind of twice that what it was for the case of just graphene on one BN. In this case, you still have a moray uh, super lattice and you still have a moray potential, but now you expect that the inversion symmetry is not broken. Uh, so these actually are two very different scenarios in terms of the crystal symmetry of the total heterostructure uh, that we have access to. Uh, so what happens in a real experiment? So we can do this experiment. Uh, here's a, a cartoon image of, of how this looks. Here's my top boron nitride layer, and the arrow is just meant to um, indicate sort of crystal uh, direction of the boron nitride and the graphene in this case. Here again is a resistance measured versus density. And I'm starting off in some configuration that's where the top layer is anti-aligned, is some arbitrary alignment, so it's neither zero nor 60. Uh, but remember that the bottom graphene layer is aligned to the bottom BN. So this is what that resistance trace would look like. I have a strong peak at the charge neutrality point, and I have a strong peak at the satellite point. This peak in this case is coming from the fact that this graphene layer is aligned to the bottom BN. Now I take that top BN, and I can rotate it to alignment. And what do I see? I see that basically uh, the peak at the charge neutrality point becomes larger, and also the peak at the satellite point becomes uh, much larger. And then I can go to the other configuration, which we call anti-align, which is 60 degrees rotated. And I see uh, overall similar features again, um, but uh, kind of a, a modified magnitude. So what I really want to do is I'm going to sit uh, in density, either at the charge neutrality point or at this satellite point, And I'm going to plot the charge neutrality resistance or the satellite resistance as a function of the total angle as I spin this thing through uh, 360 degrees. And what you see is the following. So just all I really want you to take away from this is that the charge neutrality peak uh, value is cyclic. So it rises to some extreme, and then it falls and rises again. Same thing with the, charge, uh, the satellite point uh, resistance peak. And in fact, each of these are 120 degrees symmetric, which you might expect uh, based on the arguments that I made a moment ago. OK, so let me try to focus this a little bit. Uh, what I really want to know is, not what is the peak resistance here, but what are we doing to the gap in the system? As I said before, when we have graphene aligned to a single BN, we have a gap that's about 40 MeV. Uh, here, if we track the gap as a function of the angle of that top layer, what we see is that for most of the top layer angle, we have a 40 MeV gap. This, again, is coming from alignment to the bottom BN. If I twist the top BN to exact alignment with the bottom, I see that that gap uh, uh, almost doubles, uh, rises to about 70 MeV. In a recent device, we've measured it as large as 90 MeV in, a, in, a, um, in the alignment position. But if I twist to the 60 degree position, then I see that that gap is uh, basically suppressed. So just as a function of twisting this top layer, I'm really sort of modifying this, uh, this whole band structure in a pretty, pretty interesting way. At one extreme, I have gaps at both the charge neutrality point and the satellite point. At the other extreme, I maintain the presence of a super lattice, but I've lost uh, the gap. And um, we think this is just the argument that I made before. Basically, here I've got inversion symmetry breaking, and here I don't have inversion symmetry breaking, despite still having a super lattice potential. Um, OK, so uh, excuse me. As I said, I want to maintain some awareness that we're talking mostly this week about tech uh, applications uh, for these materials. So while I do have a band gap, and while that is interesting for trying to make devices such as conventional switches or even maybe DC FETs, this gap is very small. Uh, when I have graphene on single BN, 40 MeV, it's still fairly small from a technology point of view. In this case, about maybe 70 MeV, maximum uh, best case scenario. 
uh, I used to work in a lab that was a very much an engineering lab, and there the mantra was, if you could get to 100 MeV gap, then maybe you could do some, uh, some kind of device engineering. So the question really is, can we get to a larger gap value? Um, so that takes me to the next part of my talk, which is uh, that we can modify the uh, interlayer separation between these materials by squeezing. And again, this is because of the weak van der Waals uh, interlayer forces. So how do we do this? Uh, this experiment we reported last year, what we do is imagine that we can take this device structure, we can put it into a pressure cell, we fill the cell with oil, we press on the cylinder, we squeeze the layers, and what we can do is basically drive up, we think, the interaction between the graphene and the BN uh, by decreasing the distance between uh, these interfaces. Um, so how do we do that? It turns out that it's fairly complicated. Uh, I wanted to give my uh, postdoc credit who did this work for the sheer number of steps that it takes to just get this system into a pressure cell and get it working. This, of course, is after all of the fabrication, et cetera. But nonetheless, we can do this. We can make a measurement, and we can see how these systems respond uh, with application of pressure. And uh, for this talk, the thing I just want you to focus on here is the charge neutrality point. So at ambient pressure, we have... Uh, a peak resistance that's about 25, 20 kilohms or so. And as we apply pressure, this peak resistance increases. This is a log scale by as much as 100 kilohms. So we're doing something. What I really want to do is plot the gap in the system and how that evolves with pressure. Remember, in this scenario, this is not graphing a line to two BNs. It's graphing a line just to one BN layer. So we start off with a gap in the system that's about 30 MeV. It's not quite uh, perfect alignment, it looks like. And as we apply a gap, uh, something interesting happens. First of all, the uh, activation energy of the charge of trial, uh, the satellite point doesn't show any uh, sort of variation. But the gap value that we extract at the charge neutrality point shows a diverging trend um, with pressure. So two and a half gigapascal, we've increased this gap by, uh, again by nearly a factor of two. So the origin of this, I don't really have time to go into today, but it, it has to do with the way that these lattices actually uh, relax uh, once you place them together. So the graphene uh, is not a rigid system. It relaxes into a strain configuration when we place it on boron nitride. And understanding how that strain uh, develops as a function of pressure allows us to reproduce this, at least in, in one theor theoretical model. But the basic punchline here I want to emphasize is that this gap can be basically made to diverge as a function of pressure that we apply. In this case, we get a factor of two. If I imagine doing this with a system in which the graphene is aligned on both sides with boron nitride, there I start off with a gap that's about 70 MeV and I would expect that I would get the same response. So you might be able to get to 150 MeV or so um, in this system. Uh, so that could be interesting to some of you because I think that it starts to sort of become technologically relevant uh, by some metric. Okay. So finally, I want to talk about um, the, uh, the last part of my talk is going to, is, I'm titling it uh, Twisted Bilayer Graphene, or if you like, a combination of the previous things I talked about both twisting and squeezing. So what we can do in this system is kind of special, is we can think about putting one layer of graphene on top of one other layer of graphene. I'm gonna ignore the presence of any external dielectrics, presence of boron nitride, et cetera, and imagine that I can make this system and I can control the twist angle between these two layers. So this is an interesting thing to think about, uh, going back uh, now to around 2010, there were a handful of papers that pointed out that actually if you can make such a system, the crystal structure of the composite heterostructure is pretty interesting in a number of ways. This is work by Jean Millet in which he pointed out that you actually get some kind of quasi-crystal ordering if you go to the right angle, 30 degrees mismatch. This looks like, uh, uh, like a non-periodic kind of uh, you know, Penrose tiling. Uh, around the same time, uh, two groups, um, Morel and Bistritzer, this is a McDonald group, uh, showed that uh, in the small twist angle limit, uh, this band structure is actually quite complicated. Uh, that results as a function of uh, twisting between these two layers. And in particular, they pointed out that right at what they call the magic angle in the original paper, you get this low energy band in the system where at the charge neutrality point, a flat band emerges. And this flat band is interesting because its width is sufficiently narrow that you would expect that in this band, Coulomb interactions would dominate over uh, the kinetic energy term. And in this paper, they theorized and work that followed sort of theorized that if you could realize such a system, then this is a recipe for emergent behavior. So because Coulomb interactions dominate, anything could happen from maybe getting magnetic ordering to getting superconductivity, um, et cetera. Okay, so where does this flat band uh, really come from? I just want to take a moment and, and illustrate uh, at least a simple understanding of where this comes from. 
five minutes. Um, so here again is the uh, lattice structure of graphene. Here's the well-known linear dispersing uh, band structure for that single layer. What I'm going to do is put on top of this a second layer now. And what we're going to do is twist these two layers, one relative to the other. And what that does is it displaces the dry, these dry cones in momentum space. And what can happen is, uh, if you, is that if the angle is small enough, then basically these, uh, you get basically a hybridization between these two layers if they interact strongly enough. And that opens up a, a, a small gap in the system, a hybridization gap. And what that leaves you with is this low energy band that is kind of isolated from uh, the higher energy bands. So this gap here is the hybridization gap, and the value of this is determined by how strongly interacting the two layers are. The distance from the position of this gap to the charge neutrality point in the system is a direct function of the angle of these two uh, layers, one relative to the other. And uh, the overall bandwidth here is determined by some combination of these two. So now what, uh, what was realized was that um, the minimum bandwidth is achievable basically when this energy scale matches this energy scale. And you can get to that point by twisting in a fine, finely precise way to exactly uh, kind of the magic angle. So I rotate these cones in such a way that this energy scale now matches this energy scale. And in that condition, I get the minimum bandwidth that's called uh, sort of now the magic angle when that happens. So that magic angle is uh, 1.1 degrees. How do you do that in practical reality? You need to actually know in principle what the two lattice orientations are to begin with to be able to twist to such an angle. The way this is done is uh, a clever technique sort of uh, developed at uh, UT Austin by the Tattoo group. You begin with some more piece of graphene. Maybe we don't know its starting orientation. So what we do is we rip it in half. We rotate one half relative to the other. We place that on top of the first half. So now we know what these two uh, lattices are relative to each other, even if we didn't know the starting uh, absolute orientation. So by doing that, uh, Pablo at MIT, Pablo Herrero, Herrero at MIT, uh, reported the remarkable discovery last year that in fact, if you twist these systems to the magic angle, um, really spectacular physics emerges. In particular, they identified superconductivity, also the emergence of a mod gap at half filling of that low energy flat band. Um, the basic model that they apply is that in this uh, magic angle configuration, again, you have this moray lattice and the electrons basically condense on the AA sites of this moray lattice. That results in something that looks like a Hubbard model and in the end, there remains an open question of whether the superconducting phase diagram uh, really arises from this Hubbard model type physics and uh, appears to resemble possibly uh, the superconducting phase diagram in the cuprates. Okay, so that was the work from Pablo. Uh, shortly thereafter, we reproduced his, his data. Since then, many groups now, several I would say, have uh, investigated the system. And uh, in summary, there's a lot of interesting physics that has emerged. Uh, again, We've all sort of seen some version of a mock gap, superconductivity, some groups have observed ferromagnetism. This arises from adding a third uh, alignment of the twisted bilayer graphene to the boron nitride. Recently, a quantum anomalous Hall effect has been observed, et cetera. The main point I want to make here is that uh, despite now several groups reporting the system, basically no two devices have shown the same details. And the details are important because of our expectation that the phase diagram in this system may be resembling some universal phase diagram present also in the cuprates. So for example, on this system, this is work from our group, we see that we have, in addition to the original superconducting pocket on the whole side band, we observe some superconductivity in the electrode side band. Uh, recent data from the Efetov group, which shows sort of much cleaner response, shows that absolutely missing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so experimental challenges, why are the details so hard to get correct? One of the challenges is that this bandwidth varies extremely rapidly with angle. Uh, so here we're looking at the width of the flat band as a function of angle. And you see that you actually meet this condition of uh, Coulomb energy exceeding the bandwidth only for a narrow range, 1.1 degrees plus or minus about 0.05 degrees. So you have to get to a really precise uh, angle to sort of achieve this. And as I pointed out before, the friction is very low in these systems. So even though we can place two graphene layers, one on top of the other, at an angle that we want it to be at, it doesn't necessarily s uh, stay at that angle. Okay, the other problem is that there's significant disorder within these systems. So here's an STM image showing that the Mori unit cell varies in size dramatically over only a few tens of nanometers and so on. Okay, so uh, I just want to sort of get something out very quickly at the end. What this motivates is that what we really want to have is access to dynamic control in the system. Uh, it was pointed out uh, a few years ago, I guess two years ago now, last year, that um, 
this magic angle actually depends, as I said at the beginning, not only on the twist angle, but on how strongly interacting the layers are. So in fact, there's a, there's a suggestion that you could vary the magic angle by applying pressure to tune the system also. So let's go back to this cartoon. Here's our bands with the hybridiz hybridization. Rather than um, tuning this bandwidth by varying the angle, what we can do is apply pressure and vary this hybridization gap. And as a consequence, uh, reintroduce the flat band. So I'm almost out of time, so I just want to show that we've actually uh, done this experiment. So we start off with a graphene device that's at 1.3 degrees, so far from the magic angle. Uh, we apply a pressure, and we induce now an insulating state at half filling of the low energy band, which is the Mott gap. We observe superconductivity, and that superconductivity evolves as a function of pressure. So in this particular device for this angle, we can see TC varies non-monotonically as we apply pressure, and we see that the peak TC actually coincides with what you theoretically expect for the system uh, uh, with pressure. So the basic punchline here is that pressure provides a new route to turning basically any angle uh, into the magic angle. Okay, so I'm gonna have to finish there. I have one more thing I'm not gonna have time to get to, uh, which is can we do this in other systems? Uh, I'm just gonna show you that yes, we can. We have recent data suggesting that we can realize similar physics in twisted TMDs. Uh, possibly even with some evidence of superconductivity emerging in this twisted bilayer TMD system. Um, so uh, let me finish by just saying there's a lot of opportunity here, many things to do. Uh, in terms of device applications, we have a whole slew of new tunable degrees of freedom that we can take access to, um, et cetera. So let me fin finish there and uh, welcome your questions.